Uh, good evening, everyone, and most welcome to Dar el Hikma Online Teaching Excellence webinar Lessons Learned. We are very pleased at Dar el Hikma to share with you our experience and teaching practices, which, were, which our students and ourselves found to be highly successful while teaching online in the last months of spring and even currently in summer. So I would like to welcome you again and welcome our presenters for today, who are also our faculty members in the Dar al-Hikma beloved university. So welcome Ms. Mona Al-Haddad, Dr. Eli, Martin Eli, Dr. Reem Muslim, Reem Abu, Dr. Mir, Reem Abu Hamayel, Ms. Noha Halawani, and Ms. Maha Noor Ilahi. Welcome you all. Welcome you all. Uh, it's my pleasure to be with you in this Dar al Hikma webinar, and it's my pleasure as well to introduce Ms. Mona Al Haddad, who will be talking about digital portfolio, after which she will be ready to give five minutes for questions and answers. Ms. Mona Al Haddad is a lecturer and coordinator of the Special Education Department at Dar al Hikma University. She has 10 years of experience in the field of teaching and training in autism and applied behavior analysis. Her research interest focuses on training staff how to teach students and children or children with special needs. Wish you, Mona, all the best in this webinar. The platform is yours. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Randa. This is a very great opportunity to share with the audience uh, and exchange our knowledge uh, and expertise uh, together. Um, I just would like to say that uh, Dr. Farida and some, they are having difficulty accessing um, you know, our webinar. So shall we start and go ahead? Or uh, is there any change of password already? No, 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 no. go ahead and I will manage this. Okay, go so I'm gonna share my screen now. Okay. Please. Yes. Can you give me the access to share? I'm trying. It says I can't. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, here we go. Thank you. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, today we'll share with you our experience uh, at uh, the School of Health and Behavioral Science and Education and how we manage uh, through the COVID-19 uh, period and moving to the virtual learning to continue with our pre-planned and predetermined uh, assignments that we uh, designed for uh, our semester of this year. Um, I'll start by talking about the student portfolio and, uh, and then move about uh, to discuss further how the student portfolio can be easily transferred to be a digital portfolio. Um, this is, and it, it's worth mentioning that my experience uh, was with uh, senior students uh, from the special education program. Um, so that's why developing a portfolio was not new for uh, our students, uh, especially the senior students who usually are involved in uh, practicum experience throughout the semester. Uh, so you can imagine like having students in practicum, uh, they're collecting data, uh, having a lot of information uh, to share at the end of the semester in their portfolio and the amount of information they are, uh, they were prepared basically uh, to share some of these information and some of these data were like, let's say concrete, okay, or in a paper format. And then uh, because of the uh, pandemic of COVID-19, everything was seized and they, they have to carry on with whatever information they have collected throughout the semester and what additional uh, data and information that they wanted to share when we started the virtual learning. So when we start talking about student portfolio, we will like to start by defining what is the student portfolio. Okay, so for most of you, student portfolio is nothing new or uh, it's not um, um, something that only college students um, do. Actually, uh, student portfolio is being used uh, forever and it's being used among even school students, okay? And many schools actually ask 
their students in primary age or uh, secondary also uh, a, a stages to develop their portfolio. Sometimes the portfolio is for one course, okay, or sometimes it's a collection of work uh, that across the specific uh, year, academic year, or uh, across specific uh, project uh, that being assigned uh, to the students by their instructors. So we all agree that it is a collection, okay, that we want to see the student work and we want to see educational evidence of their learning outcome, of their progress, of their achievement, okay. So this is when we ask them to, to develop their portfolio. For us at Dar al Hikma, portfolio is one of the most essential product for senior students in, uh, in our department, uh, the special education department. It, it's basically uh, their show of case and uh, of, of how much they know, the knowledge and the experience uh, that they have been through uh, throughout sometimes the, you know, their degree or in particular, I would say, throughout their practicum experience. So therefore, we use it as a tool to evaluate the coursework and academic progress of our students as well. Uh, it is also a tool to determine if the student has met the course requirement. Does the student basically develop all the uh, exact number of, uh, of programs uh, assigned for the cases in their practicum side? Does the, does the student collect enough data for all of the programs and all of the teaching sessions that they were involved in throughout their practicum side? So it's for us, it's, a, it's, a, it's the evidence that show if the students has, uh, have met the requirement of, uh, for completion uh, of this uh, practicum experience or not. Also, it's a very useful tool for helping the students to reflect on their academic progress. Um, like one of the things that I remember uh, one of my graduate students, senior students that uh, said to me after like seeing her portfolio and other uh, students' portfolio, uh, it was clear for her why she missed some point, for example. It was clear for her that she was not collecting enough data uh, for, uh, about uh, the cases that she was assigned to. Uh, so it is a good tool and it's a very helpful tool to make the students reflect on their academic progress as a learner, on how much they gain and how much effort they put in, uh, in terms of uh, working uh, on specific cases or in a specific uh, assignments. And of course, the most important part for student portfolio or why we call it portfolio, because it's, it's there for them. So basically you are helping the student to create a tool that will be a lasting archive for their academic work. So the students will have it forever. The students will keep it. The students should always uh, think carefully while developing their portfolio, because this is, as I said, it's, it's, it's an archive of, of, uh, of many years sometimes of their academic work or sometimes of an intensive uh, course that they worked hard uh, to reach the, the ultimate outcome or goal of that specific course. Now, when we think of uh, portfolio, always uh, it comes to our mind many tools for creating the student's portfolio. Now, I have to say that only the publication or the sharing of the portfolio uh, is the, the, the new element that was added to Dar al Hikma students. Because from day one, even for previous years, all of the students' portfolio at Dar al Hikma, or at least in the student, uh, students in the special education program uh, who are uh, going through uh, an intensive whole year of practicum experience they are used to have a digital or electronic work of, of all of their work, basically, of all of their data. However, now the alt uh, or the how they share it, that was the, the, the unique element that was added when we all moved to the virtual learning. So usually when we think of tools of creating students' portfolio, we usually think of notebook or at the end, okay, whether you were using software, whether, whether you are storing all or having a storage of all of your work as a soft uh, uh, document, at the end, students used to bring a huge binder for evaluation at the end of the year. However, now 
we thought of, of course, other solutions, other way, other ways basically of how the students will publish and share their portfolio. So apps are there, websites, Blackboard, of course, which is what was one of the essential and uh, the easy accessible tool that Darren Hikma used for students to share uh, their portfolio for evaluation and also for other peer evaluation as well. So this is how we think of tools when it comes to uh, portfolio, okay? Either we have it as hard copy or we think of any software to share it with. Now, when we move and think of portfolio, okay, um, like the, uh, the historical image of portfolio for those who graduated, uh, you, know, uh, you know, before or, or took the same course, Dar uh, al that they have to bring the binder at the end of the year, even with a flash drive, and the binder should be there uh, to uh, as part of the evaluation. However, now we are moving, uh, we moved uh, to the e-portfolio, e-portfolio e or virtual por portfolio or digital portfolio, all are the same. And it means that this entire portfolio has been developed electronically. So uh, there was an element of technology uh, that, and especially in the product of the portfolio, not in the process, because as I said, in the process, most of the students were using technology. Most of the, of the students were uh, having a, a soft uh, uh, documents uh, of their data and all of their assignments. Uh, and most of them are sharing or used to share their, uh, you know, uh, products and assignments through the blackboard so it is software at the end but the collection of it and the publication of it that's the new element that was added lately so when we say electronically it here's it means okay now you use of course apps for example um uh, you know that we will uh, have some examples about uh, and share it with you so they google and ser a search with uh, what is the best apps for uh, to uh, adopt basically to create their own portfolio. There, there are some elements of technology in terms of audio, motions, uh, camera, uh, background, uh, videos, and audios. So here, it, it, it gives us the picture of complete uh, digital or virtual portfolio. Now, before asking the students to develop their portfolio, whether it is digital or we were thinking of the old style, although it shouldn't be, uh, uh, it shouldn't exist anymore, the old style, because here we found in, even the publication of a portfolio can be done completely and beautifully using the technology. At first, all instructors and teachers should set with the student a purpose of their portfolio, why they are creating the portfolio, for whom they are creating the portfolio, okay? Is she asking them just to basically pile all of their work in a document and share it with uh, uh, with the instructor at the end uh, of the of the course or the semester uh, to give an evidence that they have done all the work. Is she looking for a progress, and she is trying to analyze some result of of uh, of their progress and uh, the learning outcome. So, what is the purpose of the portfolio? Is 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 it uh, is the instructor is helping the student basically? Uh, having uh, a collection of uh, the most outstanding work that they would be uh, uh, that they would use in the future for an award or for uh, in, uh, for another internship or even for for uh, an application for uh, graduate studies. So many universities nowadays they are asked uh, they ask the students to provide them with a portfolio to show what they are capable of. So setting the purpose of the portfolio and why the students are developing the portfolio is highly important. And of course, students, I'm not sure at Dar Hikmah only or everywhere, but they function well and they, uh, they follow the steps when they are provided with a, a rubric, when they are uh, provided with evaluation criteria. They wanted to know what the you know their uh, portfolio is going to be about and on based on what they are going to be evaluated 
So creating an, uh, an evaluation criteria and developing a rubric of uh, the portfolio is highly important. And that's an element when you move to e-portfolio, you have to consider. Now, when you move to e-portfolio, it means that the students take uh, their portfolio to an upper level, an advanced level. Uh, they are making use of the technology in different ways. Um, they, uh, they search uh, for apps, they, they search for uh, some motions, um, uh, unique way of presenting and publishing their portfolio. So this element, this new element is what we modified in our uh, pre-planned or predetermined uh, portfolio rubric. So in our portfolio rubric, and this is what you, uh, uh, teachers or instructors all over should keep in mind. Now, if you are asking at the end for an e-portfolio to be developed, make sure you have this item, this criteria to be clearly uh, honored, I would say even honored in your rubric when it comes to evaluating the student portfolio. So how, make sure that you are creating the rubric, the evaluation criteria and share it ahead with your students uh, before they go ahead and develop their uh, e-portfolio. And also it is highly important to decide with the students what you wanted to be included in the portfolio. Are, are you, as I said, are you going to show case all of, all of their work or are you going to put the outstanding work or the uh, logical, basically, sometimes the logical process. Like for example, in our experience in a special education, we would most of the time would like to uh, share with the viewer the chronological and the logical process of working with uh, individuals with special needs. So we we started by showing that how uh, the assignment or the assigning basically uh, individuals so the, uh, individual with special needs are done and then what uh, our data uh, you know in terms of uh, collecting data for observation and then uh, the tools that we uh, decided to use for assessments and then of course the objective written and then uh, writing programs and so on and so forth so here what we are trying to say that it is highly important if your portfolio it's about specific course and, uh, and you wanted to show case the process that has been done for that uh, specific course or that special experience, th this, this should be reflected in the student's portfolio. So that's why uh, such decisions should be made ahead. Now, what do you want it to be included? Do you want to include all data? or data after intervention? Do you want to include um, um, draft of, uh, of some assignment to, to show the progress of how the student uh, was and how uh, ultimately uh, the students achieved and how it become like after like uh, your constant feedback and supervision, maybe. So that decision is highly important to be made also ahead. So what we want to include and how much we will include in the portfolio. And of course, the medium the, the, of, uh, of submitting the portfolio, which is paper or digital. And now we are talking about digital. Lately, or the last tip that all instructors should keep in mind is coaching the students while uh, developing the portfolio. And this uh, step, we will talk about it even further. Now, also to motivate your student, which is, I believe, um, Students are uh, overwhelmed with many assignments. Uh, uh, and students, if they treat their, their portfolio as a regular assignment, mm, the ultimate goal of developing a portfolio would not be reached. So that's why it is highly important as an instructor to give your students some tips of why they are developing a student portfolio. You have to motivate them about it. You have to tell, to. Yani basically transfer the, the goal and the aim of creating an end of the year, an end of the degree portfolio to them. They have to feel it. They have to know this is only for you to show other what I have learned and what I'm able to do, how much I'm capable to do. 
uh, to show uh, all the skills uh, and to, sh to, to share evidence of how much uh, you know, of knowledge I gained uh, throughout my internship experience or my degree uh, in, in particular uh, study. So it is highly important to transfer this to the students and make it very personalized and individualized. And of course, some elements that an instructor should keep in mind is to have the time factor in mind. So yes, it's, it is there and it's for them. And it, as we said, it's a lasting archive and it will remain for the, with them forever. However, time factor is highly important and that's why you should, as a, as a facilitator, I would say, who will help and assist, and assist throughout the process to consider, to make the student consider the time factor. And therefore, you also should guide them how to collect data and assignments or whatever evidence from early on. So basically, when, they, when it comes to developing the portfolio, it shouldn't be now. You are just gathering all of this data okay, that we have collected, and you know where they are, and you organize them very well, and have them in one folder, in one document. So that's why from earlier on, you should give these tips and remind the students uh, to keep it in its best way for them to compile it later on in their uh, portfolio. It's also motivating to the student to, uh, to see samples of uh, previous uh, portfolios. And that's what we do all the time. We always share samples and we share even samples of sections. But on top of that, we remind the students that these samples are basically kept uh, uh, are, are kept basically uh, as an example. So their unique, uh, basically touch and personal and personal uh, reflections of the portfolio will remain to them all the time. Now, most important that the instructor should provide the students with resources of how to develop digital portfolio. And seriously, I can't uh, stress or even share enough how much the uh, the internet and like with just um, in you, uh, Yanni, with your fingertips, you can find plenty of resources showing how much is available uh, online when it comes to designing and developing uh, digital uh, resources. I'm leaving this part to Ms. Noha because I know that uh, she's going to share with us yani, as an expert in assistive technology, how much is there and how we can develop a kit of assistive technology that we can use later on for certain courses or for developing portfolio. But it is important for instructors to lead her students or to facilitate the development of a portfolio by sharing some resources uh, available. And to remind them of how the, the steps or the process of developing their portfolio should be. To plan for your portfolio, to collect uh, mater materials, and then to choose the best uh, of, uh, of, uh, of these materials to be included and then to build. And here it comes the, what is available in terms of apps or uh, you know, uh, other softwares that will help you to develop your digital portfolio and later to publish and how to publish it and share it with your instructor or your classmates or even outside external audience. Um, these are some types of portfolio, and this is also a decision that uh, the teacher should uh, or the instructor should uh, uh, make from early on. Like, do you want a product? Everything should be there, maybe. Or do you want it a process? So you want to see only evidence of mastery in, in developing, for example, programs, in collecting data, in graphing data, in um, you know, uh, choosing an evidence-based interventions and so on. So are you looking for a process where evidence uh, and analysis is there or are you just looking for a product? So this is something important that you need to share with your students from early on. The last type can be only a showcase. Showcase here, mostly those, uh, our colleagues in the VSCOM or the visual arts uh, and communication um, they, they tend to go with the showcase portfolio. But here I would say 
Also, this part should be considered in all schools. In trial case, we only focus on the best products, on the highlighted uh, outcome, okay? So because from its name, it's a showcase portfolio. So I want to share with you what I'm capable to do uh, uh, best. These are some examples, uh, all free digital tools of, uh, that can help students in creating their portfolio. Uh, seriously, they are all available. I, th I thought that I would have time even to uh, share with you how uh, in each of these websites, they are uh, sharing even um, you know, a short video clip on how to create a portfolio and how to create an account and go through uh, you know, uh, the development of portfolio or any other uh, storage of uh, electronic materials for any course. Beautiful, inshallah wonderful. We, inshallah, we webinars, inshallah, this morning. Inshallah. So I'm just sharing the names. The Seesaw, Google Slide, Google Classroom, Flipgrid, Book Creator, and many, many more. And I'm saying uh, uh, our even uh, uh, Dar al-Hikmah, uh, they share with us even how to create a portfolio on the Blackboard uh, platform. It was easy and all of our students submitted their portfolio through the Blackboard and it didn't take them like, you know, uh, you know, a second chance even to re-upload uh, uh, or even redevelop it because it was clear. And as I said, uh, you know, luckily that we have also uh, a platform with uh, different facilities for our students to submit a different unique uh, work. I would say the lesson learned of uh, such uh, a product that uh, we that we had to move it uh, entirely to be digital. Uh, it also provided us with uh, an, an additional element in our rubric and uh, as an educational tool, ser seriously. And it shows us how our students are capable uh, to uh, have uh, technological skills and their creativity, the, 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 the graph they were, uh, they used, the motions uh, that they were involved in their uh, portfolio. It shows many other skills that we all as instructors should keep in mind and should also uh, upload and encourage our students to continue having. So we saw in, in uh, seriously, we saw how they were uh, capable of, uh, of creating, um, you know, the creativity part was amazing and i think we are in a front of generation who is even sometimes they are more advanced than us we are just a facilitator we are just showing them or putting them on track but uh they can explore even uh more and thank you thank finally, you a lot <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, I admit to put this i would like to say watch out so you don't know who will end up teaching with us technology is yes. booming nowadays yeah. Okay. I know you have a lot, Ms. Mona, to say. Mashallah, your expertise is very rich in this regard. But we need to leave a room, very small room, for the attendees to ask questions. And already we have so many questions for you. Yes, uh, yes, I yes. will start with uh, Mrs. Dr. Khawla's uh, question regarding the uh, portfolio. Uh, she's asking if you, Dr. Khawla, uh, she's asking about if do you have a copy of the portfolio? If so, where do you keep it? Would it be saved online or just saved in a regular file? Uh, is it accessible and where? It is accessible. It is online. It is on the, uh, the Blackboard. Until now, it is on the Blackboard. Uh, before, as I said, that's why digital portfolio was totally new. It's the publication part that was added uh, as an element uh, in COVID-19, that they have to publish the entire uh, portfolio through the Blackboard uh, platform. However, uh, before you, students used to uh, submit, um, the, they should, uh, seriously, they only need to share with us the hard copy, okay, of the, the folder of the portfolio, in addition to a flash drive. So that's what we keep because we know how important for the students to have their hard copy portfolio. Uh, so it is there, yes, it can be available. And as I, as I said in my presentation, it is one of the lasting archive that the students have and the publication part the good point maybe i didn't get the chance to say that they can even have their parents their friends uh to see it and sometimes uh employer to look at it and see and they can now send it to them digitally they don't have to thank go you thank you thank you that is a lot thank you anyway 
uh, if any of the attendees uh, likes to ask Ms. Mona any question, they can just write it in the chat and we will, uh, Ms. Mona generously will answer her privately on her email. Just write your email and the question and we will uh, send it to, uh, to her. Thank you, Ms. Mona, again for thank your presentation. You. Thank, thank, you so much. Nice. Uh, thank you a lot. And now we'll move to our second presentation or next presentation with Dr. Martin and Dr. Uh, uh, Rima, uh, Reem Abul Hamayel. Uh, Dr. Martin, allow me to introduce uh, both of them. We'll be talking about the uh, senior case as a tool of instruction in virtual classes. Uh, Dr. Martin is an assistant professor and chair of the speech language and hearing sciences department at Dar al Hikma University. She has over 22 years of experience uh, practicing both nationally and internationally. She has worked in a variety of settings such as the school system, juvenile justice system, early intervention, private practice, and academia. Dr. Martin's research interests include interprofessional education and practice, assessment and treatment of culturally, linguistically, diversely, uh, diverse speakers, clinical supervision, clinical simulation, uh, the science of teaching and learning, international capacity building, and service learning. Dr. Martin is passionate about equitable services as a right for all. Also sharing with her this session, Dr. Reem Abul Hamayel, who will share the, uh, with Dr. Martin the same topic. Uh, Dr. Reem is an assistant professor in the same department with Dr. Martin and, uh, and clinical supervisor at Dar Hikma, Department of Speech, Language and Hearing Sciences. Uh, Dr. Reem is also a ASHA certified bilingual speech language pathologist with a three years experience in assessment and treatment of speech uh, and language disorders in children from diverse linguistic backgrounds. She is a clinical supervisor uh, to junior and senior students at Dar Hikma Speech and Hearing Clinic. Uh, her research interests focus on uh, speech and language development and disorders in children from birth to school age in Arabic and English speaking populations, uh, development of language uh, assessment tools for linguistically diverse populations with focus on Arabic speaking population, enhancement of teaching methods to practical students and undergraduate programs in speech pathology. Wish you both Dr. Martin and Dr. Reem the best in this webinar, the platform is yours. Thank you Dr. Amdur for that introduction and thank you everyone for joining us today. So we will talk about Simucase as a method of instruction that we use for students in our practicum. So we'll start with a definition of Simucase, um, what it is, how we implement it at Darl Hekma, our students' perception of it, and considerations for future use. A little bit about Simucase. Simucase is a web-based interactive platform that consists of client videos as well as a patient interaction. So within the professions of speech language pathology and audiology, our students are learning to go out into the field to practice with actual clients. And so as part of their training programs, our students complete practicum classes in which they accrue both experience and hours working with clients. Um, at the undergraduate level, there are no specific requirements in terms of the number of hours that students are required to have practicing with clients before graduation. However, at graduate level programs, our students are expected to graduate with about 400 hours of clinical practical experience. And Simucase comes into that because of the high number of hours that are required. Um, programs were facing the challenge with um, A, exposing students with the diversity of clients, but also um, giving them a variety of experience in practicum settings. And Simucase is a program that was developed um, by a group of professionals within our professions to allow students to have both that practical experience um, in a safe environment as well as to accrue hours. So Simucase is currently available for the professions of speech pathology, audiology, occupational therapy, and it is in progress for physical therapy. And with all of those major associations, they do allow for students to accrue hours in an area called alternative clinical education. Um, so it's a limited number of hours because they want our students to obtain most of their experience working with actual clients. 
So a little bit about SimuCase is that there are two types of simulations that can be completed. Um, first of all, there are observations. So those are videos of live clients that are either undergoing assessment or treatment services. So this can be used as a teaching mechanism uh, for students to link what they're learning in their academic classes to see in an application. And then the simulations are the actual interaction that students would have with the simulated virtual client. One thing that I should have mentioned about simulations is that when we talk about clinical simulations, they're typically done in one of two ways. Um, with simulated clients, they're either done with um, trained, um, in most cases it can be trained actors or actresses um, that will know how to simulate the client experience, or they can be virtual web-based such as SimuCase. Um, in terms of the type of simulation. So when we talk about SimuCase, there are three modes that it can be utilized in. Learning mode is the first mode, and with the learning mode, that provides students or users with feedback. So as they're working with their client um, through the different components, as they select maybe their answers or what their interaction would be with the client, um, when they're in learning mode, they are given direct feedback on the spot. Assessment mode is really looking at the student's knowledge and skills. So with assessment mode in SimuCase, it's the same thing. You're interacting with the client, but you're not given the direct feedback on the spot. And so at the end of the um, case, the students would submit it and they would receive a score that would rate their knowledge and skills. Based on that rating score, if they achieved a acceptable level, then those hours would be counted towards their clinical practicum experience. So you don't take away for the number of times that the students had to complete the case. It's only that in order to count the hours, they have to achieve what is considered an acceptable um, mastery in assessment mode. And then debrief mode is the last mode, and that is um, for students and supervisors to go over the cases that have been completed and to receive overall feedback. One thing that I should mention about SIMU cases as a program, it's really geared towards graduate clinicians because when we think about the practice of speech pathology, at least in the US as a model, it's the graduate students that are um, certified upon graduation to go out. And so that's one thing to keep in mind as we talk about this discussion. Uh, with COVID, our use of SimuCase here really came out of the COVID experience. It's something that we had discussed using as a department, but it pushed us in the direction to use SimuCase. Um, one thing is that it pushed us beyond how we traditionally do clinical practicum. So clinical practicum as a course and as a practice, our students traditionally are working with students at our Darrell Heckma clinic or at partner institutions such as GIFs or other organizations that allow our students to work with their clients one-on-one -on -one, um, under the supervision of an ASHA certified member. So it challenged us to do move beyond what we traditionally do to move beyond our comfort zone, our fears and our apprehension. But as a result of it, you know, there's a lot of innovation. I mean, for our students, it allowed them to have deeper levels of problem solving and critical thinking uh, because with the software program, it really looked at their clinical reasoning and clinical skills on a one-on-one -on -one level and gave feedback as they were interacting with the client versus in a traditional practicum setting, the student and the supervisor would not meet until after the session was over. And so the student, while they are getting feedback, it's not direct and in real time, it's upon completion of the session. So I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. Reem, who'll talk about the CBK components and how we implemented this at Dar al All right, uh, thank you. Dr. Martin. Uh, so as a clinical supervisor, I wanted to um, make this switch from the seeing the clients face to face to using SemiCase to provide the students with the opportunity to practice and implement the um, assessment and treatment theories and models that were taught in theoretical classes uh, to be able to implement them 
with clients. And that's exactly what we do in practicum sites. Uh, so SemiCase as a platform allowed us to uh, do two different kinds of cases. Uh, some were assessment cases and some were intervention cases. So each um, uh, case would take the students uh, through the steps that mimic exactly what they would do in an actual practicum site. So for the assessment cases, the student uh, using SemiCase is able to uh, collect some case history, to work with collaborators, with a speech pathologist, uh, to form a hypothesis on the client, uh, to be able to uh, do an assessment, select an assessment method that would be most appropriate based on the information they have collected uh, through the interactions uh, with the client and with the um, collaborators, uh, they get to watch a little bit of or uh, some um, if the a video of the assessment uh, tool being used. So they get to practice how to score a test, how to score a language test, uh, how to uh, uh, add up the, uh, the scores and to come up with, at the end, the diagnostic statement. So in learning how to interpret this data that they got, they collected, and use their clinical skills and, and critical thinking skills for clinic uh, to come up with a diagnosis and at the end come up with a recommendation that they could use for this assessment case. Uh, so that basically the steps that SemiCase takes the students through and it provides them with a visual um, feedback on how well they're doing throughout uh, those different steps. The intervention cases in SemiCase allow the students to go through the different set of skills that are needed for intervention. So these are basically uh, therapy uh, sessions that are being conducted uh, through simulation. Uh, so every therapy session, usually the clinician starts with collecting some baseline information on the client, previous report, uh, assessment reports that were done, uh, progress report notes from previous uh, uh, professionals uh, and other speech pathologists or progress report from a previous year if it's, if it's a child who is in school. Um, work with collaborators uh, if it's a client with a stroke, uh, for example, getting a neurologist report or getting a uh, physical therapist report or occupational therapist report uh, so that the student here is able to um, get the opportunity to collect the information and see different reports from different uh, professionals who will later on work with them in the real setting or in the workplace uh, so that they can come up with what uh, the treatment uh, plan for that session and uh, make the decision on where to go with that, uh, then the student would be selecting a treatment plan that fits best the client at the time and giving all the collected information. Uh, so in semi-case, the student gets to uh, see different uh, treatment approaches that might be a potential choice for this case, and then they would select that treatment approach and answer questions regarding it. Uh, they also get to watch videos on that treatment approach being implemented, learn how to take data and how to um, uh, collect it and, and then interpret that data to come up with the uh, progress report for that session. And then at the end, the summary of what that session is uh, looking like. Did the uh, client achieve their goal? Did they not achieve their goal? Did they need more uh, cueing? So all these uh, clinical skills that uh, the students do practice in the traditional practicum sessions uh, or uh, settings get to be practiced as well uh, in uh, semi-case. So as you can see in the next uh, uh, slide, um, I'm sharing with you the, uh, let's see, the uh, interface of semi-case accounts uh, with the students. If we can go to the next slide. Dr. Martin, can you go to the second slide, please, to the next slide? Yeah, here. Can you see it? Not yet. Not yet. It's not. Oh, here we yet. go. All right. So okay. this is an example of how SemiCase's uh, website looks like. Uh, so here I'm logged in, uh, and it is an assessment case based on the um, 
uh, the six components that are written on the top, case history, collaborators, hypothesis, assessment, diagnosis, and re recommendation. So the student here is uh, getting to choose uh, questions that are related to their, um, the components of the, the case. Um, and um, this is an, a case open in uh, a, um, a learning mode where you can see on the top uh, left corner or the right corner where the student is getting feedback green green uh, uh, writing in writing where it says keep going so the student is making a good choice and that sh shows the student how they're progressing in this case and the uh, on the left side uh, corner where there is a circle in front of case history and this circle um, changes in color or fill, fill up the color from yellow to orange to green when the student is making good progress. And so it's giving them real-time feedback if they have chosen a correct uh, question, if the interaction is correct, if they have paid attention to the information they have collected and uh, so far, and what else they want to um, uh, acquire. So here it's being a, 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 while collecting case history, interacting with the mother of the child, so ask her different questions uh, about this specific case. Uh, so going to the next slide, um, you can see, um, let's see. Uh, so here the circle is filling up uh, with more uh, color, meaning that the student is on the right track. And again, getting uh, the green uh, message on the left, on the right corner, telling them that they're on the right track. The next slide shows you if the student makes a choice of an in incorrect uh, question or incorrect uh, inquiry, uh, it will give them also a feedback in red. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Yes, so here either the question was insensitive or was uh, not appropriate for this age. Uh, so this is how you can see the real-time feedback in learning mode that the uh, semi-case uh, platform provides. So at Dar al Hikma, uh, uh, we wanted to make sure to, uh, to teach the students how to use this platform for uh, them to learn how to implement uh, their um, assessment and uh, uh, treatment methods that they have learned. Uh, so uh, the, the way we did it, and I say we because it was me with uh, three other clinical supervisors. Um, uh, as you know, with COVID-19, a lot of planning has to happen before we implement a, 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 a method with students. So we did review the different cases that were on semi-case. As Dr. Martin mentioned, uh, semi-case was designed for master students who have had in-depth classes uh, or in-depth knowledge on the different disorders. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that we select appropriate uh, cases that are uh, for the student level. And after that, we collaborated with the students in the demonstration phase where we worked with them in synchronized sessions uh, through Zoom uh, to teach them the different steps on how to use semi-case, uh, how to go through the program, how to navigate it, and what it meant for them to uh, select a, an appropriate uh, uh, interaction and how to use their clinical knowledge that they have gained earlier in their class to implement it while using the program. So we demonstrated to the students and they had the chance to ask questions and, uh, and then they logged in with their own accounts using a learning mode with us while the supervisors are with them on the um, synchronized Zoom session uh, for them to also go on the cases and use the program and get their own feedback so they can get to ask questions. Um, and get, when, once they get their feedback, they get to ask us and we elaborate a little more on the uh, choices that they have made. Uh, then we, uh, we discussed the different treatment approaches. We uh, gave them more handouts on the different approaches that were used uh, in, in the um, 
uh, Sammy Case uh, shared with them more information on also assessment uh, tools, uh, different uh, language assessment tools and uh, speech assessment tools that were used in the program that they may, might have only um, uh, learned about in theoretical courses uh, uh, or read about. Uh, so, and then the students had the chance to um, uh, complete one case on assessment mode because we wanted to understand our students. We wanted to gauge their ability to, or their performance uh, using this new model. The new model was new for us, but also new for them. So before we wanted to give them grades, we wanted to see how would they be performing. So uh, we gave them an, ass an assignment without uh, being graded just to see how well they would do. Uh, then we met with them again uh, in, subsequent uh, Zoom sessions to discuss with them their performance and uh, the reports that SemiCase provides. Uh, from a, an instructor standpoint, my dashboard from SemiCase as a faculty provides me with a report that is personalized for every student. So I get to see where each student have made correct choices, what mistakes they have made, and how um, what feedback they got. So when a student wants to uh, uh, discuss her case and I can give very uh, individualized feedback to the student on what they have uh, done. So we discussed that in a person in one-to-one -one as well as a group uh, where we also discussed the implementation of the different clinical skills used, the different treatment approaches, how would they look like uh, in uh, different um, with different clients and why did we get to choose this or why a treatment approach was more appropriate for this client than another treatment approach that might have been a consideration. Uh, we provided the students with a lot of additional sessions, sometimes subsequent session on the same clients to see how well they would develop in therapy and sometimes would be new clients. Because the nice thing about SemiCase, it provides a variety of uh, cases, a variety of uh, age group, vari variety of um, uh, disorders that sometimes your actual uh, uh, practicum site might not be able to just because of the nature of the site. Some sites are more geared toward children, some sites see more adults, uh, while SemiCase provided this variety of opportunity for us to discuss with students, as well as uh, some medically complicated cases or some simple uh, speech and language cases. Um, so overall, I think the, that SemiCase provided us the opportunity to really achieve multiple uh, SLOs where when we had to stop our face-to-face uh, -face interaction with the clients in the Dar al um, speech and hearing clinic that we had, uh, uh, this program provided us a chance to uh, still continue with teaching the students and continue to show them how to implement and demonstrate their clinical skills. So one of the things that we wanted to do with utilizing the SEMI case was find out what the student's perception of this experience was. Uh, so we had the students complete a survey that looked at a number of different things, such as their previous client experience, their overall thought about their learning experience, the knowledge and skills gained, their confidence, as well as their preparation to go out as clinicians. So we'll go through a brief number of questions just because of uh, purposes of time. So the first questions here uh, talk to the students' feelings, particularly nervousness. A lot of times when students are working with actual clients, they're very nervous. So the first question just asks, were, did they feel more nervous when they were working with an actual live client? And as you can see, half of the students agreed or strongly agreed that they felt more nervous working with actual clients. Um, what, the second question that we asked was, were, you, were they not as nervous when working with a simulated client? So did they feel more comfortable um, making mistakes working with the simulated client? And what you can see here from the numbers is that a higher number of students either agreed or strongly agreed in terms of their perception that they felt that working with the simulated client, it was a safe experience for them to make a mistake with the um, simulated client rather than in an actual live session with a live client. Okay, 
um, learning experience. So we had two questions that we asked the students in terms of learning experience. And again, this isn't the overall survey. We asked about 20 questions in the survey. We're just highlighting about six. Um, one question dealt with their cr uh, critical thinking skills. Half of the students agreed that they either agreed or strongly agreed that the um, working with the simulated clients um, helped them to develop their um, critical thinking skills. We had a number that were neutral and um, very few disagreed with this. Uh, when asking about whether or not they wished that they had been introduced to this cl clinical simulation experience early in their program, we had um, half of the students that are strongly agree that they wish that they had learned about or been exposed to the clinical simulations earlier in their academic program. So what are some considerations for future use? We looked at both a faculty perspective and a student perspective. So from a faculty perspective, um, one thing that we thought we should consider adjusting the rings for students. So mm -hmm. one thing with SimuCase is that we know that the level of students may be that it was created for and the level of students are different. Um, we may also want to consider using a combination of SimuCase and traditional practicum experience. Um, and this is because with the SimuCase experience, the students would have a variety of different type of cases that they may not see in the clinic. Another thought is to include SimiCase in the theory, pra uh, theory, classes, theory classes so that our students have um, more application of both assessment and treatment in their classes and so that they're linking theory to practice early on rather than just waiting until they actually make it to the practicum class. And then the last consideration from a faculty standpoint is knowing that our students may not be familiar with uh, some of the terminology and or have exposure to a variety of assessment tools so that some of the tools that are utilized in the assessment of SIMU case may not be the tools that we have in our actual clinic. So we may want to diversify. Um, from a student's perspective, the students felt that while SIMU case was great, um, that it did not compare to working with actual clients. And so um, mm -hmm. some of the feedback that they gave is that they thought it would be useful to do SIMU case more in learning mode with multiple cases so that they could be more familiar with the platform um, prior to using it in the assessment mode of this, that's directly like linked into concerns about the grading system. Um, and then they felt that SimuCase should be incorporated into all of their theoretical classes to apply practice to theory. So what are our lessons learned? Um, there were a number. So while we felt that SimuCase was effective for um, clinical instruction, we do recognize that we need to modify it if it is a tool that we're gonna utilize with the Darrell Heckma undergraduate students. Um, we do feel that it would be beneficial to expose our students to this technology throughout their enrollment in their program. So learning mode can be easily um, incorporated into various classes to give our students um, exposure to different diagnosis, uh, to different materials, and really to help them develop their clinical reasoning and judgment skills. Um, we definitely agree that the students should have adequate exposure to the learning mode prior to the assessment mode just for ease of use so that they feel more comfortable. Um, another consideration is that we want to maybe expose our students to more digital materials. So one thing that came out of COVID as a whole is um, speech pathologists across the globe uh, ran into the same um, issue in terms of clinical practicum or clinical experience. And so for all of the undergraduate and graduate students, um, a lot of programs turn to SimuCase for use with their students. In terms of the actual day-to-day -day practice, what we found is that a lot of school systems, a lot of private practice clinics, they're seeing their clients through um, digital, through telehealth. And so with the telehealth, that meant that they had to change the materials that they were utilizing. So maybe for assessments, they started using di digitalized assessment materials versus um, paper and pencil assessment materials. And so we may want to, as a program, thinking about how we may move forward in, in the profession 
is exposing our students to more digital materials so that they are familiar with that. And then the last one is consider implementing maybe telepractice or telehealth as part of our curriculum um, for our students become a, to become aware of telehealth, um, not only as a mode of service provision, but just as a practice overall. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Dr. Reem. Yes, and thank you, Dr. Reem. It was a really amazing presentation. Um, I liked a lot the emphasis on the assessment, and this is actually what all of us are worried about uh, in addition to the teaching practices and the learning activities, but the assessment is a big and important part of teaching and learning. Thank you very much. I wish we could stay longer, but we have other and we have some questions that you maybe we can only um, uh, give a chance to answer one of them because of time issues. And definitely we will uh, please add your uh, emails into the chat in order that Dr. Martin and Dr. Reem can answer you privately on, the, uh, on your emails. So if you open the chat, which question do you like to answer, Dr. Uh, you have more than one question. Uh, maybe uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Banton is asking about how how can you grade them? So, oh, how can we grade the students? So yes. depending on what we utilize, so the SimuCase program itself, if we were to use utilize their mechanism, once the students do a case and assessment mode, it assigns a grade for the cases. Um, what we would have to do in terms of grading for our students is the reason that we did baseline measures is we wanted to see where our students would perform. And so in terms of grading, we at Darrell Heckma would have to modify the way that our grading uh, compared to the system's grading. So knowing that if a student mm -hmm. maybe achieved a score between 70 and 80, while that may not be acceptable for the SimuCase program, because of the level of our students, once we take baseline and we can come up with maybe um, a mean and an average, we can determine what the scores would be that would be appropriate for our students. Thank you very much again, Dr. Martin. <clears throat> Please, if you can share your email in the chat, Dr. Reem already did. So as anyone who wants to email you privately in order to send you any question, if you like, and I'm sure that you will answer them, that will be uh, yes. feasible. Thank you a thank lot. You. Thanks for this presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very and much. now I, thank you. I want to uh, move to Ms. Noha, Ms. Noha Halawani. Are you ready? Yes. Uh, Welcome, uh, Ms. Noha. Uh, Ms. Noha Halawani now will be talking about the basic steps towards having your own kit of assistive technology. Uh, Ms. Noha, Noha Halawani is an assistive technology specialist at King Fahad Medical City, and she's also a lecturer in the special education department uh, in Dar al Hikma University. Ms. Noha, uh, she provides assessment training and solution in the field of assistive technology. Uh, she's interested in computer accessibility and accessibility in general, uh, augmentative and alternative communication, as well as environmental control units. Uh, I wish you all the best, uh, Ms. Noha. Thank Thanks for sharing us uh, your presentation and your expertise. The, the platform is yours. Okay. So first of all, thank you, Dr. Renda, for wel the welcoming introduction. And thank you all for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed this session and the previous, you enjoyed the previous sessions. Um, so today's topic is basic steps toward having your own kit of assistive technology. Uh, this uh, steps or this basic steps could be um, um, inspiration for you guys, or it could be uh, a guide for you, or some of you, maybe it could be a review for you. Okay. Um, let's start. First thing first, uh, I, I, I always like to um, have uh, uh, stay on the same page with everybody else. So what are assistive technology? It's uh, or any item, piece of equipment, software program or product system that is being used um, to in either increase, maintain or improve the functional capabilities of people with disability. Um, basically, in general, it's any item that could uh, help people, people with disability to increase their independence plus to improve their quality of life. 
So let me show you a very quick video that explains this in a very nicer way. What are assistive technologies, or ATs? ATs are, in the words of the World Health Organization, assistive products and related systems and services developed to maintain or improve functioning and thereby promote well-being. This means that ATs are technologies which can assist a person in doing something that otherwise this person would not be able to do or would have difficulties with. ATs can provide different kinds of support. For blind people, ATs are often based on tactile communication like braille, or sounds to replace images, text-to-speech devices, or technology to assist mobility. For deaf people, ATs can increase the sound level, for instance by means of hearing aids, or replace the sound by images or vibration-like visual alerting devices. For ASD, ATs are often designed to overcome barriers in communication. Here, augmentative and alternative communication technologies have been developed like speech generating devices. ATs can be medical devices, but it is also possible to use mainstream technologies for assistive purposes. For example, GPS navigators with voice interfaces are often used by blind people. Video phones for sign language users and video games can be used by people with ASD to simulate and prepare for daily specific situations. Okay. So now I just want to highlight uh, something in the definition. As uh, I said before, it's any item. I need you all, um, whenever you hear uh, the word assistive technology, I don't want you to think about something يعني, fancy or complex or expensive. There's a range of technology. The assistive technology could be no or low tech. It could be mid tech and it could be high tech, just to keep in mind. Okay, now let's start with the very basic steps that, that I personally find very helpful to have my own kit, or if you want to have your own kit, you could use that also. Um, and I always recommend everybody, if you are dealing with people with disability, if you, you might deal with a, a person or a student with disability, I always recommend to have your own kit ready all the time. So what are these steps? The first one is explore and make a list of your favorite resources. The second one is do it yourself if possible, then use whatever in your reach. Starting with the first one. Okay, uh, some of us sometimes we don't know uh, what terms uh, to use when we search um, in the area of uh, assistive technology or any other areas. So these are su just suggestions for you guys to help you. Uh, some, some of these are phrases, some of these are it, uh, terms. You can use it whenever you, you like, or you can play also with the words. So the first one is you can type if you are looking for assistive technology in classroom, or you could say assistive technology for learning disability, or you could say low tech assistive technology for writing or reading or um, whichever um, skill you're looking for. And then um, assistive technology for dyslexia or dysgraphia. Uh, you could also type apps for dyslexia and dysgraphia. You, if you're looking for a software, then you can change the word apps to software. If you're looking for something free, you have to add the word free. If you're looking for a specific language, then just add, uh, for example, Arabic uh, assistive technology for dyslexia or dysgraphia. Uh, another uh, step or another, I mean, um, element that you could use or that could help you in uh, this process uh, is to look for uh, these types of assistive technology. Uh, these could be um, a standalone assistive technology. At the same time, you can find them in your own devices as an accessibility feature. So the first one is text to speech. And then we have speech to text, uh, then proofreading, word prediction, mind mapping, and many others. Starting with text-to-speech, I'm pretty, pretty, pretty sure that all of you uh, know what is text-to-speech. Basically, it's transforming the text, uh, the written uh, language to the, a spoken language. Um, it's very useful because it provides multi-sensory reading experience that combines seeing with hearing. Um, it also uh, improves word recognition. It increases the ability to pay attention and remember information uh, while reading. It allows uh, students or kids to focus on comprehension instead of sounding out words. Uh, it also uh, helps kids recognize and fix in their own uh, writing. At the same time, it helps, let's, let's be more specific, it helps students uh, with, uh, let's uh, say, learning disabilities in general. It helps uh, students with, uh, to be more specific, um, 
help students with uh, low vision or um, uh, blind uh, blindness. They have blindness. It could help them instead of um, uh, read, uh, reading because they cannot see. So it's easier for them to listen or to hear the text written over there. Moving on, uh, then we have the speech to text, which is uh, absolutely the opposite of text to speech, um, which is transforming the uh, written, uh, sorry, the spoken language to written text. Uh, basically, it can help, um, it can be a great tool for students who struggle with handwriting or spelling. Uh, again, it helps students with, with learning disabilities. Um, uh, also, it could be a very great uh, tool to help uh, students with uh, uh, who have weaknesses in their motor skills or paralysis. Uh, but at the same time, uh, their speech should be intelligible to be able to use this uh, tool. Uh, I forgot something here. Uh, the speech to text, sometimes they refer to it as um, speech recognition technology or voice to text also. Okay, now we have proofreading. Everybody knows what is proofreading. It's for students who struggle with writing, uh, including spelling, grammar, uh, punctuation, word usage, uh, sentence structure. And I also believe proofreading is for everybody if you wanna submit something professional or legit or uh, in a good manner, then everybody should use proofreading, of course. Uh, then we have word prediction. Uh, it helps students with writing issues by suggesting words while typing. I believe many of us have used a uh, word prediction feature in our phone, um, like while you're typing or texting, uh, another word will appear, like maybe three options will appear up and then you can choose immediately instead of typing or writing the, the word. Uh, it's a very great tool for students with learning disability. It's a very good tool uh, for students who have, uh, again, motor, uh, low motor skills, uh, because instead of typing the whole word, by just clicking once, then uh, the, the student or the user will immediately pick the word. So it will save time and re reduce effort. And then we have mind mapping. Everybody knows what is a mind map. Uh, basically, it helps process and present information visually. Um, mind maps is available uh, or mind map uh, mapping is available as software, uh, apps, application, uh, online sources, of course, also. Um, it's a very great tool to help students uh, with learning disability, or let's say, let's be more specific, uh, who have difficulty in writing or reading. It helps them uh, in planning and organizing their thoughts. Um, it's a good tool also for studying. Of course, it's like a preparation before exam uh, for some students uh, who are also visual learners, of course. We don't forget also the learning style, of course. Okay, moving on. And now I want to share a very good uh, resource uh, with everybody. It's uh, understood.org. It's a very great resource that is uh, very resourceful and it has very great information that you can go back to whenever you need. Um, you can just keep adding uh, to your own kit by adding like a very good resources, uh, links, software, even if it was just the names that you could go back to whenever you need it. And now we have the second uh, step, which is do it uh, yourself if possible. Uh, in this step, I'm not referring to like do or invent a, a wheelchair, but why not? I know it's, uh, it's possible, but I'm talking about um, doing something very easy and um, like low tech assisted type of assistive technology. Um, I also uh, recommend this for people who work in an environment that has a uh, low budget or like uh, they lack resources, then it's a very good um, way of having your own assistive technology that could help students with uh, writing issues or with reading issues, um, depending on the case. I'm gonna share with you three different examples, very easy. That could help instructors or teachers, um, either if it was any, uh, a regular school or um, and, um, different centers, depending on the uh, case, of course. Uh, pencil grips, pencil grips help students to, um, to hold the pencil or the pen uh, to help them in writing. Um, each teacher could uh, invent or make a uh, grips different uh, tools as you can see in this uh, picture they used uh, different balls uh, they just made a hole inside it and then they inserted the pencil um, 
I, th I believe uh, it differs from case to case, depending on the case of the student or the, the client, if you're working with clients, um, you can use, um, let's say, Play-Doh, you can use different uh, type of materials, you can, you can use um, beads, for example. Um, in this case, if you're not familiar with pencil grips or you find it difficult to find the perfect pencil grip for your student or, or your client, then you could um, consult, uh, uh, if you have an access, of course, to an OT, an occupational therapy, then it's a, a good uh, way to start, of course. And then let me give you another example. And then we have focus reading cards. Um, it helps students with the reading uh, problems. Uh, let's, uh, dyslexia, of course. Um, you could also bring uh, a ruler, let's say. It's a very basic and easy way of doing this. Bring a ruler and uh, a colored one, of course, and just like uh, give it to the child or give it to your client and then they could like follow the line, uh, each line by line. Uh, you could do it yourself by bringing um, colored uh, paper and then you make a hole or make a, a line and you cut it and then you can add the transparent, the colored transparent um, paper inside and then voila, you have your own focus reading card. Uh, so maybe some of you think it's hard, some of you think it's easy depending on your um, uh, style. If you, maybe some of you don't like uh, art and craft, but I'm going to share with you, of course, um, an, a very useful resource afterward. But before that, uh, this is the last example I have here, which is a slant board. Uh, slant board, it's very useful for students uh, who needs uh, like a height, uh, um, like more height to, to reach um, the table, for example, to write something or to, it's like an adaptation, let's say. Uh, we also could use um, for reading, like to hang a book or to hang just like a part of a book or a paper to help them read, especially if the person has a physical disability and they need more uh, height or more adjustment um, in their table, of course. As you can see in this picture, uh, they, they used uh, a, um, a binder, sorry, uh, to do the slant board and you can be more creative making it like, like from recycled uh, papers or from cardboard or you can be more creative, uh, like I had an idea if you could use it, um, Lego, Lego, the toys, then you can build your own um, a slant board so it's very easy uh, and it's very useful and you can save the environment of course uh, okay everybody knows what, what is a Pinterest of course uh, Pinterest is a very good and helpful resource that could help um, that could help you guys um, in finding different uh, type of um, uh, solutions and like ideas to help you in doing your own assistive technology and any other stuff that you can find over there like to do it yourself. And now let's move to um, the third step which is use whatever in your reach. In this step um, I, I'm, I'm going to ask you a question uh, for everybody. What type of device are you using? Uh, I'm not referring to the, the de device itself or the brand itself. I'm asking you what type of system are you using or what type of system your students using? Um, are they using um, Windows? Are using uh, iOS, Apple? Are they using um, Android and so on. Why I'm asking this questions because in this step, I need everybody to explore their own systems by going back to their um, uh, settings and finding out what accessibility feature they have over there. You will be very amazed and very shocked whenever you go back and uh, check the accessibility features. There are tons of features that are available over there for uh, different type of uh, skills, like for reading, for writing. Um, it could help them uh, in their assignments and, their in, and, and in their projects, of course, to do their projects and assignments in a very easy way. Um, it's, they are available for free for them uh, since if you have like an access to a PC or in the classroom, let's say, or you have a laptop or they have their own device, of course, then you could go and explore and help them out by uh, enabling uh, these types of features. 
uh, some of the features that are uh, over there uh, already, I already talked about them uh, at the beginning, which is text to speech, speech to text, or they call it voice over. Uh, no, sorry, voice over is another uh, feature, which is allowing uh, the person to hear whatever they touch. Uh, they can like read this, it's like a screen reader for them. Uh, it give them uh, and guide them, give them uh, instructions, of course. So you will be very amazed when you go back and find about your uh, devices and, um, and it's already there and sometimes we don't know about them because we don't use them or be, because we don't need them. But like while others need them, but nobody is helping them or guiding them toward these available technology and it's for free already and they are, it's built in, uh, our, uh, in their own uh, devices. Let me show you uh, two clips, two videos that will inspire you to find out about your own uh, devices. My daughter recently had a very serious medical condition. This was a very scary time. Gabby had a seizure, which she's never had before. And within 15 minutes, we found ourselves at the hospital. We had lots of information coming at us from many different directions. As a blind person, I needed to have access to information only available to me in print. We had my wife at the hospital with my daughter. I was traveling back and forth on a daily basis. Both of us needed to be able to access all of the information at all times from different devices. Fortunately, in my case, I use Office 365, both personally and professionally. I was able to quickly use my phone's camera to scan information available in print. Ready, double tap to capture. Capture. So if a doctor handed me printed articles, I was immediately able, using Office Lens, to add that information to my ever-growing OneNote notebook. I was able to focus on my daughter. I was able to make sure I had all the information I needed. Good news is Gabby is doing very well. She's thriving. She's back in high school. I couldn't be happier about what OneNote has enabled me to be able to accomplish. And I think that by making it accessible and by making it usable by all, what Microsoft has done is opened up limitless possibilities to people. So it's not an advertisement, of course. I'm just going to share with you two different systems just to inspire you. Let me show you the other video. People think that having a disability is a barrier. But that's not the way I see it. You can catch up with friends. Ready? You can capture a moment with your family. One face, small face, focus long. And you can start the day bright and early. You can take a trip to somewhere new. Jack opened his eyes. You can take the long way home. Or edit a film like this one. When technology is designed for everyone, it lets anyone do what they love, including me. Uh, yeah, and that's it for today. Hope I inspired you. If you have any question, please feel free to ask it. Thank you very much, Ms. Noha. It's really insightful presentation and needed especially for school teachers uh, within the increasing number of students and children with disabilities with learning disabilities specifically and especially that what you presented is uh, 
uh, is a lot handy. We can, as parents or uh, school teachers, we can help in developing such or use, using such kinds of technologies. Uh, we have a few questions for you uh, raised from um, who's there, who's going to, uh, I think Dr. Khawla, with the tool that changed speech to writing, recognize different accents. I think that this is a good question. Yes, um, I'm, now I'm talking about English. I'm not talking about Arabic, actually. I don't have enough experience in uh, available tools in Arabic, especially the speech to text. Um, I tried one, and yeah, in the settings, like before you start, uh, you could choose what type of uh, accent you have. Like, are you, uh, let's say, like Indian American, or are you um, like uh, Latin American, and so on. Yes, the, it could recognize different uh, accents. Any other question? Uh, I think uh, uh, there is a comment, I think, by uh, Miss Noor Al Jindi. Uh, yeah. She's asking to download Be My Eyes app. It can help blind persons wherever you are yes. related to. It's yes. very, very helpful and very like amazing tool, uh, assistive technology. It's very amazing, actually. Yes, yes, I know it. Yes. Yes. So thank you very much, uh, Ms. Noha. Also, kindly, if you like to uh, write your email in the chat box, whereby if anyone needs to contact you for any question at a later stage, you can answer him or her. Uh, sure. Thank you very much. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Uh, and now allow me to move to our last presenter. Like we say in Arabic, it's, uh, let me welcome Ms. Um, uh, Maha, Ms. Uh, uh, Maha Noor Ilahi. Uh, she has uh, 18, 19 years of experience in the field of teaching English literature and drama. Uh, Ms. Maha is a lecturer at the general education department at the Hikma University and uh, she's also a certified Berkman uh, consultant. Uh, she's a writer and a poet and a podcaster. Ms. Maha is an author of a Saudi Women's Voice book published in 2015. That's in addition to being an establisher and editor-in-chief of Arabic um, magazine Marafe. Uh, I wish you all the best, Ms. Maha, in this presentation, and the platform is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Randa, for your introduction. Uh, hi, everyone. How are you doing? And uh, thank you so much for uh, joining uh, this session. Uh, can you hear me well? Okay. Yes, yes, Ms. Maha. Yes, and okay. the screen is there. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, so, my uh, session will be about the mindset for new times. And of course, we know, we all know that we are uh, perhaps in a new era and uh, times are always, and things are always changing. Um, like, let's talk about a few years ago, who would have ever thought that remote teaching or flexible working hours or working from home uh, would be the norm? Who would have ever thought about this? Uh, such ideas were looked down upon and perhaps frowned upon a few years ago some institutions, even some countries, uh, they refused to accept people who studied or got their degrees uh, remotely. Uh, and even if we go back uh, 20 years ago, we would remember those people who refused computers, PowerPoint presentations, uh, the internet altogether. But things have changed. In fact, things will always be changing. Uh, my presentation today is um, um, about accepting change. Um, and it's very general. Um, uh, I'm going to explain uh, uh, a few points, uh, inshallah, as we're going to see. Uh, today, we're working from home, operating uh, institutions and companies and getting paid while we're staying in our comfy houses. Uh, it seems that online teaching has helped us figure uh, out things and find solutions for the lockdown. However, uh, online teaching is not the magic bullet that will solve all problems. The real magic bullet, I believe, has been and will always be uh, our mindset, the resilient mindset, which is uh, my topic for today.
when the corona lockdown happened at the, at the very beginning of the crisis, our president, Dr. Suhail al-Qurashi, kept repeating this word, flexible, flexibility, be flexible, be flexible. And the flexibility, a lot of people take it in a negative way. They think it's weakness. It's not weakness. Uh, I would like to quote Richard Bronson because Richard Bronson, uh, the founder of the Virgin Group, uh, was one of the very few people who initiated working from home and flexible working hours. Uh, so, um, just a second, please. Uh, yeah, okay, I'm sorry. Yes, okay. Uh, he said that the tried uh, and tested route is not always uh, the best path to success. Thinking differently can open up great opportunities and possibilities. Now, let me ask you a question. You can answer me in the chat if you, if you like. Uh, what is the most important advantage of online teaching and learning? What do you think? What is the most important advantage? I don't know why I can't see the chat. Okay, yes, I can see it right now. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, it's convenience, it's flexibility. It's very important. Now, if we're trying to mold online uh, teaching and learning to become something like actual learning, we are taking the soul of it. But what is flexibility in teaching? What is convenience in online teaching? I mean, how can we be flexible without jeopardizing quality? This is a very important thing that I was thinking about when Dr. Suhair kept telling us that you have to be flexible. Now, in this session, I'm gonna talk about flexibility in a more detailed way. Um, and I'm going to term it as the resilient mindset, which is the mindset for um, all changes for uh, every time, for now and then and in the future, of course. Uh, I will have a discussion also uh, in detail on one aspect of the resilient mindset, as we will see. And then I will have uh, fruitful practices that uh, my colleagues and I in the general education uh, have used and tried uh, during the corona lockdown, and it worked with us. Now, let me just discuss with you uh, the three mindsets in education in general. Uh, we have three mindsets, the rusty mindset, the restless mindset, and the resilient mindset. Uh, I'm gonna go over them very quickly. Uh, the negative, the, the rusty mindset usually have, uh, or has a negative attitude towards students. Uh, they resist change. Anything new is not worthy. Anything new is bad. New is evil. Uh, also, there's a, a uh, great deal of uh, dogmatism, my way or the highway. Uh, the mission of this kind of mindset is finding fault at students, at colleagues, at anyone. Uh, the rusty mindset looks at teaching as a battle of powers or authority, so teacher versus uh, student. They're always in, in this kind of fight that I'm going to the classroom, whether actual or virtual, to prove myself to uh, show the students that I have authority. Uh, they already know that you have authority. <laughs> okay, restless mindset. It seems to be the opposite of the rusty mindset. The restless mindset is unrealistic in employing uh, new approaches. It's like they're in a fashion marathon, but in education. Always, always, always in search for new approaches. And always, they always want to try out these new approaches without uh, sufficient uh, or considerable thinking without planning. Uh, and keeping up with new things is amazing. It's a must in our field. However, always being uh, running after new approaches and throwing away all the traditional approaches uh, is not healthy for education. Plus, it will uh, deprive us of developing what we already have, the current approaches that we are using. So blindly believing in new approaches does not really work, uh, does not do good for uh, education. The resilient mindset is a balanced mindset. Uh, the attitude is, in general is positive towards students. Uh, it looks at teaching as a learning experience, mutual exchange of learning between teacher and student. Uh, the resilient mindset is aware of the challenges and accepts the change. Uh, open to new approaches, but at the same time appreciates uh, traditional approaches. Uh, the mission is finding solutions to make the best of the learning experience, to facilitate the, the learning experience for both students and teacher, of course. So new is not always better, 
Traditional is not always worse. Balance is the goal. Now, what is the resilient mindset exactly? Resilience is conscious flexibility. You're not weak. You're not forced to uh, be lenient. No, you know what you're doing. You know that if you take two steps backwards, it's better. Better than taking 10 steps uh, forward. Sometimes, not all the time. So you, you're always assessing the situation and being conscious about your flexibility. So it's flexibility coming from strength, coming from power, not coming from weakness. Uh, resilience in higher education, as it's defined by uh, Chris Lip and Bush, uh, it's bouncing back, adjusting, and succeeding in response to shifting demographics, political environments, economic markets, as well as increased demand for service. This is uh, so applicable, especially to our times. Um, but let's go to the heart of, of, the, of the session is that there are three different aspects of resilience. Awareness, well-being, uh, not three, sorry, uh, different aspects. Uh, awareness, well-being, vision, acceptance, listening, motivation, and much more. But I'm going to focus only on three, uh, or actually on one only, because um, uh, I'm, the, the first two, awareness and acceptance, are very clear. I'm going to focus on the third one. So awareness of strength, weaknesses, and challenges, uh, and acceptance of change as part of growth and continuity. Uh, and the most important thing is listening to the other side, to the customers, and uh, in our case, to the students, listening to the students. So, hearing the story from the other side, or hearing the other side of the story, which is the students. Now, uh, as a Berkman consultant, uh, I found it very useful to understand the personality types of students. Now, we all know as, to, as teachers, we all, we all know that we have to cater for styles, uh, visual, kinesthetic, auditory, read, write, uh, style, holistic, analytical learner. Uh, we need to cater for all these styles, and this applies to actual classrooms and to virtual classrooms, the same. But also catering for different personality types is very important. According to the Berkman assessment uh, profiling of uh, characters or personalities, we have made three major uh, types, or actually four major types. Uh, this is not to limit the personality types. This is just to give a helicopter view, a very, very general view. Of course, there are so many variations. So we have uh, four types, which are the red, we call them the doers, the green, the communicators, the yellow, the analyzers, and blue, the thinkers. Now, I'm not going to talk about uh, the doers in detail or each type in detail, but I'm going to talk about the behavior of the reds or the doers in class, whether in an actual classroom or in an online classroom. Usually, the reds cannot stand long talks or slow flow of lectures. So if your Zoom classes are going very slow and you have disconnection problems that you have a lot of, or you're allowing students to interrupt you and to talk uh, while you're talking, you're going to lose the reds immediately. They are task-oriented people. They want to work. They want to be given tasks all the time. They're very quick, very fast. They want everything. They're very impatient, usually. Uh, during an online class, even in an actual class, actually, uh, they are the ones who will keep asking you. I'm sure you've, you've faced this before. Uh, they are the ones who will keep asking you, what are we taking next? What is our next task? Or what is our task right now? Uh, what assignments should we do? So how can we cater for, those, for, for the Reds' needs or for the doers' needs? Uh, from my experience in online classes, from my experience this, this, uh, this uh, last semester that, that was in the lockdown, uh, keeping them engaged and busy by asking questions all the time, keep asking questions, or giving small in-class assignments or activities, uh, if you have group assignments, make them in charge because they have good leader leadership skills. Give them responsibilities. Uh, never put them in the same group with slow learners. Why? Because this is unfair for both, for the doers, for the reds, and for the slow learners, because the reds will take charge. They will keep rushing uh, the slow learners to work faster, and this will uh, deprive the slow learners from learning, from the whole learning experience. Now, let's go to the greens. 
the Greens are the communicators. They love talking and they love communicating. They are extroverts, extremely extroverts, people oriented. In an online class, they tend to feel lost and they panic a lot if they don't feel the instructor is available for them during and after class. Uh, they will participate more. By the way, even in an actual classroom, you will find them very outgoing and well-spoken and maybe they will participate more. However, you will be shocked uh, in, a, in a negative way when you see their papers or their work. Usually they, they talk a lot, but the, the, the quality usually is less, usually not, not generalizing. Um, they will participate more, raise uh, their uh, uh, raise questions uh, more than other students. They might even interrupt you. Um, they cannot tolerate the idea of self-study. So maybe, maybe online uh, studying or online learning is not the best solution for them. Uh, now, if we have a choice, they won't, they won't choose this. If they don't have the choice, they have to, of course. Um, they hate studying alone. They love studying in groups. Uh, they get bored if the work or assignments are not varied or creative. You have to be creative in your assignments. Okay, now, how can we, uh, what can we do for the Greens? Uh, I suggest, and from my experience again, engage them in creative, creative group activities or discussions. They love it. Uh, give them a chance to talk, encourage them, recognize them all the time. Give them a chance to communicate with you regularly after the class. I am sorry, this is, uh, they, it's a need for them. They need constant communication and it's draining, honestly, but they need it, especially, I don't know, we, we cannot really judge the situation because we were in a, in a crisis time. We, we all didn't have a choice. So maybe in, a, in an online classroom where everybody uh, has chosen to study online, things would be different. Uh, actually, I think it will be different, definitely. Now, for the yellows, the yellows and the blues, uh, they are the quiet students, usually. In an actual classroom and in a virtual classroom, they might not uh, participate a lot or they might not participate willingly. If you ask them a question, they will respond to you. Uh, interruptions, they hate interruptions. Um, they are attentive, although they are quiet. Um, might ask you for elaborate explanations, elaborate details might stop the whole lecture to ask lots of questions about a very, very small and minor detail, and you have to answer them, otherwise they will not let you continue the class. They will always feel lost if, if you continue while they have a point that they don't understand. Uh, how to deal or uh, suggested practices with the yellows? Give individual tasks or assignments. Don't rely completely on group assignments. There must be a variation between individual tasks or assignments and group assignments. Rubrics must be given ahead. The rubrics and expectations must be detailed, detailed guideline and, uh, guidelines and detailed feedback, of course. And set your expectations of the assignments very clearly from the beginning because they will give you a headache if you don't set your expectations of what, what you're expecting from them from the beginning. Now the blues. The blues are also quiet, they're introverts, but they are people-oriented uh, one-to-one, on a one-to-one -one basis. Uh, they're very quiet in the class. Uh, they seem disengaged, disinterested, but they will surprise you when they answer. Uh, they might ask intriguing questions. They might be reluctant when uh, asked to work in groups. Actually, sometimes they refuse. These are the students who refuse working in groups because they are self-learners. And uh, these students, the, the quiet ones, uh, those are the ones who amazed me during the online uh, classes. And the results amazed me really because they showed a great deal of responsibility and self-learning skills. Uh, suggested practices with blues, uh, give them uh, more time. They need time to reflect and think. Uh, don't insist on having them talk in front of the class. Um, Trust that they understand, even if they don't want to participate. I know this is a bit difficult, but if you understand their type, you might, uh, you might want to try this out with them. And trust that they understand and will do well without asking you many questions. Uh, actually, they are uh, a blessing in, in a class, in an, in an online class especially. Now, uh, fruitful practices uh, of uh, courses of a theoretical nature, and I'm talking about, of course, the general education courses. Uh, uh, I have talked to some of my colleagues about the, the major or, or the most useful practices that they have done 
uh, during the, the lockdown uh, classes, so to speak. Uh, the most important thing was that we all almost agree on is calling on students, calling on students by the name, not just to take attendance, but keep the, the calling on running. Uh, Leila, Nada, uh, Faiza, uh, answer this question. What do you think of this? Just simple questions, quick questions, so that you keep the flow and make, them, make sure that they answer in the chat. Uh, designing the lectures also, the way you design the lectures uh, determines the success of the online class. Uh, the first week for me when I taught uh, communication skills uh, was very overwhelming, but then I developed this style, uh, 10, 5, 10 basis or 5, 10, 5 basis. What does this mean? 10 minutes for instruction, five minutes break for short assignment. You give them a break, nobody is talking, but they're doing an assignment, a simple assignment, maybe a group assignment, and then 10 minutes for, to discuss the assignment because they are learning from this assignment. Or you can have it in, in, in another way, five minutes for discussion, you discuss, you ask questions, and then 10 minutes you, you give instructions or explanations, and then uh, five uh, minutes for discussion of what, you, uh, what, what instructions you have given them. Also, I found something very uh, useful, uh, which is the PowerPoint show, uh, Asynchronized Classes. Uh, I recorded the, my, uh, my voice on the slides. It was very organized to the point. The, the blues, the reds, the yellows, they appreciated it a lot because it saved them a lot of time instead of going through uh, or instead of going over the Zoom classes uh, all over again. Okay. But then I, I had to give Zoom classes, of course, online classes so, or, or live classes. So uh, I gave the PowerPoint show first uh and uh, gave them assignments and then or an assignment and then we had the, the zoom class which was for questions discussions feedback on the assignments whatever you you want to design it uh, in any way you want to design it and i found these uh, practices very useful um maybe of course uh, uh, other um, instructors have uh, other practices maybe this does not apply to all courses but it worked uh, very well with courses like Islamic, Arabic, and uh, English courses. Uh, of course, uh, before I uh, close, there are supporting tools in online classes, and these supporting tools in an online setting, it's considered our office hours. Of course, email and Blackboard goes without saying, WhatsApp or Telegram. I know a lot of instructors might not feel comfortable uh, using uh, you didn't connect to students' their numbers. Um, but uh, I found it very useful. And also one-to-one -one meetings uh, are very, very useful, especially for weaker students who need help uh, and for the Greens, because they want to keep communicating with you and asking you lots of questions. I found them very useful. And uh, thank you so much for attending the session. And if you have questions, you can ask in the chat.